Welcome to Feed Your Please, everybody. My name is Joseph. I'm your co-host, Peter. And thank you, big ups, to Ian and Sarah for this amazing new theme song. Uh, they, uh, upon request, back in the day, two years ago, uh, did a theme song for us when we said, Hey, uh, you guys are musicians. Can you do a a bad recorder cover of Voyager's theme song? And they said, Hold on, let me do this bottle of Jack and we'll get right back to you. And then they, they made it. It was great. And we enlisted them to do one for Picard since we shifted to doing Picard reviews. It's an imp- it's even better than I could have imagined. 12 seconds in, I lull every time. Dude, at, when you sent me the wave file to, to show me what we had, I was getting uh, breakfast ready and I dropped the wooden spoon into the frying pan because I was laughing so hard at that 12 second mark. To quote Truman on a, the support group, uh, when he plays the podcast, his dog runs to its crate. <laughs> He hates it in there, too. This poor, adorable dog has got this picture of just being wounded in, in this crate. I'm like, this is this is perfect. I'm like, I'm sorry, but at the same time, it's, I'm not. I felt bad that we because we knew Voyager. Well, you knew what Voyager was going to be getting in and, and the Voyager theme songs a little crappy to fit the motif of crappy Voyager. After that first episode of Picard, I'm like, man, maybe maybe our intro is going to be too harsh, but Thankfully, we've we've grown into it uh, by the second episode. Joe, before we jump into anything, uh, I want to do a little recap for anybody who might be joining us fresh here and talk about the rules that you and I are playing by on this. Yeah, um, by all means, this Picard thing, this is this is a big fucking deal. This is like the Grand Prix. This is the this is the what's the big football game for the sports people? Oh, the Super Bowl. <laughs> Yes, yes. This is what everybody's gathering around the campfire for. And uh, all the nerd podcasters, I'm sure the the millions of us, uh, you know, this is the fresh meat on the table. Um, So you and I are playing by some pretty strict rules here. Uh, Obviously, we are watching Picard the day it comes out. You're watching it early in the morning. I have to wait until I get home, but I'm not looking at social media. We're not looking at any secondary sources. We're trying not to engage people on the Internet. We're trying to keep our ideas theories and uh and jokes fresh for our listeners at home and not contaminating with any other popular media out there so uh, i've just watched it fresh it's 9 30 at night for us here in eastern standard on january 30th and uh, what you're gonna be getting is all fresh original content and it is our goal as as star trek fans to be fair in our appreciation and brutal in our humiliation uh, where appropriate. All true. Being a real fan of something and not just a a mindless fanatic or fanboy requires you to accept that the things you love have both good and bad elements, ups and downs. And being honest about those critiques is... And it gives you, I think, a broader appreciation. I I consider Star Trek of all of the fictional things ever created, probably the one that's the most important to me on number of levels. That does not mean I can't see uh, some even some real class A garbage in even the franchises that I adore the most. And being able to be honest about that and have a good laugh uh, at its expense uh, is healthy for any fan and we try and embody that we're not getting paid to do this uh we are not in uh, any big studios pockets we're not running commercials um we're not getting paid to make jokes at 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 franchise expense and i think that you know when you sign up with us the nice thing is we're, we're small enough that you're getting honesty and you're not getting uh forced content So we appreciate having everybody along for the ride. I think even if it was just one person out there listening, I'm certainly doing it because I want someone I can talk Trek with for an hour. (laughs) I mean, this is why this started is why we've kept it up for two years is Peter and I long ago really just had this idea to do this. And eventually we're like, you know what? I just kind of want to talk to start about Star Trek with Peter and then we can put it on the Internet and maybe people will listen. And here we are with hundreds, (laughs) hundreds of listeners Um, but it's fun for us. We wouldn't do it if it wasn't otherwise. And they're fun listeners, man. That's the best fucking part. Like 
our listeners are actually fucking rad and every single one of them we've interacted with has been a good time i mean we we were on a we were on a podcast and produced in australia that you know uh, we did sci-fi characters for like that are our fans of the show like Taryn and Mike and Hale and shout Mike. out Hale and well met Hale and well met and short tra- and uh, show short tracks <laughs> the yeah. shorts podcast <laughs> sorry boys <laughs> didn't mean to put you down like that <laughs> yeah so everybody that's joined us along this ride has been fantastic it hasn't been it it isn't the world and that's probably for the best because the world can't handle our takes and on that note Peter what did we fucking watch this week? Season one, episode two of Picard, Maps and Legends. Peter, I have I have made a terrible mistake in my life. And that is I got into the habit starting with the first episode to watch it in the morning before I go to the gym because I'm just so excited. You know, at first I was just filled with trepidation and excitement. I just had to fucking know. And then we reviewed the first one. We're like, oh, this was pretty good. And so I woke up. This morning, I'm like bright eyed, bushy tailed, four o'clock in the morning. I got my coffee. I'm going to watch this thing before I go to the gym. It's going to be great. Pet my dog, pet my cat. It's all good. And I watch this and then I'm left with the rage that it left me with for like 15 hours before I can talk to you about it. I've done nothing but vibrate in place like the fucking flash, like just ready to just burst off into a hate energy vortex. Ever since I watched this thing, I went to the gym and I was like, I the tiger the whole time. I'm push-ups i'm fucking lifting weights oh it's cards man i'm gonna snap you into a slim gym like i i was so in the zone i can't do it again i gotta watch this shit at night so that if it pisses me off like this again i i won't have to wait all day to talk to someone about it uh what what do you think man it was certainly a letdown overall the first episode wasn't perfect but it started laying down a rich tapestry of connections back to next gen key episodes. And I think there was a lot of promise and some genuine good storytelling with a couple pitfalls, which, you know, we can assign to Kurtzman. Uh, But this one just slow paced. And I mean, there's only 10 episodes of this season, right? And that's not, that's not standard Star Trek. Next Gen was like 20 some per season. This is new TV. This is Game of Thrones seasons here, right? You got to pack shit and you got to move things along. And this was just a real filler episode, it felt like. Um, I did think that the pre-credit flashback, the pre-opening credits flashback to um, First Contact Day, which is going to become Space 9-11, the workday at Utopia Planitia shipyards was pretty cool. And I did enjoy that. I, 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 this episode did not, was not without its moments. I agree. That moment was a good one. And I don't want to nitpick the things that I did appreciate about it too much, because I think the systemic flaws in this episode are large enough that you don't need to go down that route. My opinion is similar to yours in seriousness, uh, obviously, I was very high on the first episode. I felt like it set up a lot of cool potentiality, and then this one just is like, nah, I, it's, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna, we're gonna fucking yutz around for a while and kind of squander all of that goodwill we built up for in that first uh, forty-five minutes, and it was very disappointing, and. It turned from disappointing to rage inducing at one specific point. And so I would like to start discussing this episode so that I can get to that point and possibly have a stroke here live on the air <laughs> with you. All right. Uh, so, like I said, we pick up on first contact and we get our first real good look at what Utopia Planitia is all about. And this is a big deal. Right. This is where the Enterprise D was born. This is where the majority of Starfleet ships are produced. And I think it's really cool to see again. Slice of life stuff for Starfleet and life in the 24th century. Uh, overall, it seems like a pretty standard factory life, uh, which is interesting to think about when you remember that none of these people are really being paid and everything in this post scarcity society just kind of rotates around reputation or perception i mean any of these people could be living a good life with a replicator and a holodeck which 
strangely, we haven't seen anything to do with holodecks at all so far. And and I wonder if that's going to continue. The The big standout difference here is the presence of synthetics. Uh, we got a guy walking down what looks like a U-Haul self-storage facility, rolls open one of the red U-Haul doors and says, good morning, plastic people. And I want to discuss that line of dialogue with you. Was that cheeky and fun or was that cyber racist? I think they're trying to give a clear impression that the Utopia Planitia blue collar guys are cyber racists. Uh, they certainly kind of abuse the simpleton programming of these androids for their personal amusement. Uh, I liken what they did to like making a dog do dumb shit for, you know, cause they trained it to, you know, uh, I don't think I, certainly there was one person in the group who was not about the synths. And I think some of the other people in the room were more like classic Roddenberry. Hey, we all just get along fine and we can turn the other cheek with the best of them and just accept people for what they are and move along. Like that's something that we've discussed very heavily in Voyager is that, you know, there can be serious sins of seven of nine and, and the Maquis and these other people that they've incorporated into the crew and just say, the Maquis specifically, the fucking murdering terrorists, and just be like, it's cool. We've decided to forgive you, and now we're going to work alongside you side by side. But maybe that's just Starfleet. And, you know, the Maquis still certainly held on to their resentment for a while. So it's not really all of humanity. Maybe there's just, you have to, like, score pretty high on the Prozac scale to be able to put on the Starfleet uniform. Otherwise, um, you know, you don't. And that's, maybe this is a more realistic look at the, the other people of the future. Uh, we got F8, which is our Android we're going to focus on here. And it's got the gold data face and body paint. It's got the gold data contacts. But this guy is bald and he's got some clear markings on his head and his uh, red jumpsuit. And again, this is why I'm confused that Picard was pro synth because this utility drone is exactly what data was afraid of. And it's a, it's a race of slaves that exist to serve and why Picard wouldn't see that for exactly what it is when it very clearly is that is beyond me. So there's a key moment in Voyager where that we are not to yet that almost begs to be discussed here. I, I don't, I honestly want to ask you, Peter, do you want to get into it? Because it's something that a lot of Trek fans probably looked at this and this question came to mind. Well, let's do it. Let's let's sacrifice okay. my my spoilers of Voyagers to of voyages to come and uh, and bring it out. So late in Voyager's run, I want to say this might have happened in the seventh season. The doctor the, Voyager gets in relatively constant contact with Starfleet that occurs. They've, they've teased that already at the point where we are on the show that they're going to try to do that. Eventually they are successful. And the, and the doctor decides to publish a hollow novel. That is his like perception of his life as a, what he calls being a, a holographic slave that gets published and becomes successful, but his publisher doesn't want to like essentially acknowledge his rights as a person or they won't obey his desire to unpublish it when his crewmates get offended. That's what it is. And so there is a tribunal that's held with, a, you know, a Starfleet JAG officer to determine if the doctor is a person. Right. Measure of a man part two. Basically. And they punt the question of his personhood a little bit and instead do the half measure of saying, we're not prepared to acknowledge if the doctor is a person, but we are prepared to acknowledge that he is a being that has a art as he's an artist. And he is, as a consequence, entitled to the right of ownership over his art and that his publisher has to respect that. So uh, the it ends with the revelation that. Uh, the, all of the old EMH programs, all of the EMH Mark 1s, have essentially been repurposed to be s manual labor uh, mining dilithium. 
And so this dilithium mine has like hollow projectors built around it. And it's a bunch of Robert Picardo's like mining away, being treated essentially as mining slaves. And they're all talking about this hollow novel that they've all done when they went to maintenance and how it's got them all thinking about their lot in life. OK, that's so how that is ends. a direct relation to what was the psycho murderer aliens guy uh episode of voyager where the the yeah yeah where balana gets all fucked up (laughs) right like they go on to the the i mean that's the the exact same thing there with that uh, that guy was designed to live in a little room and handle nuclear waste yes so that's that's the same thing so yeah all right there's there's a very strong correlation here that you've got android slave labor why would picard be behind that i also want to point out it's ridiculous that these guys would even get put away for the night because if you've got uh, anybody who's played Detroit AI, which was or Detroit Become Human, which is an amazing game. Did you play that, Joe, yet? I have not played it. I know it's a Quantum Dreams game uh, no. because I, I just I just watched it on YouTube because it's a Quantum Dreams game. So that's what you can do. Um, you don't actually have to play it. Well, it's coming out on PC. Check it out. But if you've got AI labor, you're running that shit around the clock. Like that's that's the benefit of robots is they don't need to sleep. The fact they even get put away in the first place is silly. But there's one per little cluster. Most of the people are off planet because it's first contact day. We go through, they're kind of, they're, they're really, they're creating this scene as a stark opposition to what we saw in next gen, where everybody enjoyed data's presence, embraced him, helped him learn and grow. And instead, these people are just kind of putting up with this guy in their midst trying to go about their day without really interacting with them and op- some openly, you know, voicing distrust and uh, concern about it. Sadly, that's going to turn out to be founded uh, while they're eating their lunch out of what's clearly a 3d printer casing that they've fit a replicator into. This dude gets hacked. His eyes kind of flicker as he's getting uh, sliced up. That's a star Wars term, by the way, slice. West End Games, anyone? No? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, good job. You did it. Yeah. We're here for you, nerds. Um, he goes over and starts working some control panels, uh, presumably in conjunction with the rest of the synths who just got hacked in this attack, and uh, they start turning the Mars defense matrix against itself. I want to point out my biggest gripe, I think, about this new Picard property because it gets showcased here. And again, this is what, 14 years ago, 14 years from the beginning of the uh, series. That is correct. Star Trek has always showcased fantastic technology that I think has innovated and inspired. And I don't know why it strikes me such the wrong way to see the fucking Iron Man 3d screen swipey computers. (laughs) <laughs> yeah uh, it's it's when like you, a aesthetic that we can't quite get away from right now is it when i saw that in iron man like him putting together the iron man with the 3d models and like tossing stuff to this screen and that screen and talking to jarvis and working with his hands it was like wow that's really fucking cool and then you saw it in something else and it's like okay that's cool too when you saw that in picard at any point we're like wow this technology looks really great no, I've seen this for 10 years now. Fuck it. It's so overplayed and just fucking boring. Like, I know what the future technology is supposed to be like. It's it's black, glossy panels. And I'm not saying that like, uh, not my Star Trek, but it's like, I, there's nothing impressive about this anymore. You're you're pushing into this technology retread. Just stick with the flat displays and don't jam this hollow BS down my throat any more than the rest of the world already is like. Look, before we get away from this uh, opener, oh. <laughs> I wanted to follow up, follow up my thought about why I conveyed the story about the holographic labor. So it, that scene in Voyager sets the tone canonically for the idea that the Federation has a ethical dilemma and how it deals with artificial intelligence and uh, manual labor requirements. And so the idea that they move away from a complicated program that could have arguably achieved sentience to uh, dumb robot dogs that clearly are not sentient 
um, I kind of buy as a thing they would do. I just think it's just kind of weirdly performatively abusive of the employees to just kind of be shitty to this this non sentient you know robot uh, for when, the sake of doing so. You know, when I saw uh, whatever the the short trek was uh, that dealt with this, and then the recap we get in Picard of how it went down. I imagine that all of the labor on Mars was going to be synth. And that again, like I just said, working in a factory sucks and these people aren't getting paid time and a half to work on a holiday right. or anything like that. Like, right, right. What motivation do you have to be some dirty, grimy shipbuilder in the future when you could just be chilling out on a holodeck beach with a replicated margarita? Yeah. Robot labor, holographic labor for all the real shit jobs makes a lot of sense. I thought it was just going to be tons of these robots doing everything, not one robot per five people. So it, it just seems like a needless half measure, I guess. Like there's already humans doing this shitty stuff. Anyways, you haven't eased the human condition. There's just enough robots there that it's still slave labor and you still have dirt on your hand, like, you know, guilt on your hands. It's it's the worst of both worlds, I guess. And uh, I will say that it was neat to see all of the uh, warp fairies that they were building because the you, the initial shot has like this just tons of these kind of kind of per- personnel carrier ships that kind of uh, looked like that. That's what they were building. Of course, it was but for the the rescue of the Romulans. That's our first real look at the starships of post nemesis. And I want to talk to you for a second about the aesthetic that we're seeing in Picard, those fairies. And let's, let's clarify something. Picard went to Starfleet and said, we need to help Romulus. The sun's going to go supernova, right? Right. And Starfleet said, no. And then Picard said, well, I've been known to be persuasive. So does that, did he persuade Starfleet to help after all? Or did Picard turn to the Federation and say, we need to help? Did he like basically jump the chain of command and appeal directly to the Federation? And it was a Federation armada of ships to ferry the people off of Romulus and not Starfleet ships. No, I think the implication here was that he appealed to the Federation's sense of more. he may have jumped over the chain of command and went directly to the actual government the president but the government still yeah the government still commands starfleet and as a consequence commanded them to do so and that could be where there's that resentment we'll see later so uh, these but the, those are starfleet vessels yeah so the starfleet vessels they have like the very super angular like exaggerated looks that we saw on the enterprise e right like the super not not the swoopy swooshies of uh, of the Berman area or really, you know, the the Roddenberry era uh, galaxy class and nebula class and all the variants around that. Um, so you've got this clear post sovereign angular type of ship. And then like all the stuff we see around Earth, like civilian looking is like. Looks like it's discovery reuse discovery assets, especially uh, I think there were. There were a couple shots in uh, the short trek. What's a short trek's name that I keep thinking of? Children of Mars. Children of Mars. Like there, there were some ships in that. I think that we saw that looked straight up like uh, Discovery starships. So yeah, the, the model of the Enterprise A slash regular NC, NCC one seven zero one that we see later on is definitely the Discovery version of it. Um. Yeah, we don't see much, but it is definitely in the Kurtzman Trek vein of design, including the uniforms, by the way, for t- almost it's what, 20, it's 2399, right? So it's the very end of the 24th century. So almost 25th century uniforms are reminiscent of the uh, look of the discovering uniforms. I, I don't like any of that aesthetic, so I hate it. I think the new uniforms look dope. So I mean, the, they're better than the Discovery uniforms. I'll, I'll say that. I think they're pretty. I also like that the combat is let up. It's corny, but but it's cool. Uh, anyway, so this uh, this F8, he jumps to hack in the system. I think the uh, graphics of Mars defense is turning on itself. All these satellites aligning and just nuking it from orbit looks badass. Uh, 
the crew tries to stop him and he goes uh, dead space on him with some sort of plasma cutter and just shoots up the joint security storms in. Looks like their pistols have uh, that the phasers are pistol style again. Right. And then he shoots them, too. And then he shoots himself. There's a lens flare. So over lens flares. Uh, but, you know, the J the JJ stuff just can't quite work its way out as long as Kurtzman's around. But and then we cut the credits after that. The first scene after credits is probably. Sets the tone, I would say it sets the tone. sets the disappointment and, in motion. Yeah, I have grown already to like this Romulan couple. The, like the old married Romulan couple who we find out used to be Tal Shiar agents, which was your suspicion. And I think uh, a, a good pat on your back for spot in that one. And th- as noted, they are Tal Shiar agents who are protective of Picard and not attempting to manipulate him because they're like using all of their Tal Shiar secret tech to try and help him unravel the mystery of what happened to Dodge last episode. Uh, I like their banter. I like the way they're portrayed as just kind of like being old and over everything. Right. And Irish for some reason. (laughs) Yeah. uh, What is disappointing, though, is this is where we start to like get a tease of like the, the figures at work here. And apparently the Tal Shiar had an even more secret or special secret police. Here's. (laughs) And they're the bad guys. <laughs> can I can I suggest a skit for us to do? Oh, sure, of course. Let's 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 lab this one, buddy. What do you want to do? I'm gonna be Kurtzman, and you're gonna be my guy who pays attention to. Tw- no, you be Kurtzman, and I'll be the guy who pays okay. attention to the people on Twitter. And you're gonna pitch me a uh, an idea where you say something about working section thirty one in. Okay. All right. I can see it now. Go ahead and start. Uh, okay. Hey, everybody. I just got done smoking all of the drugs and sniffing glue, and I just want to do more Section 31 shit. Because uh, uh, sir, sir. Um, uh, Peter, I'm with social media. Um, we might want to ease off the Section 31 hammer. People are getting real tired of this bullshit, which I know is going to upset you because you're about to launch a tired ass Section 31 spinoff show. But, uh, you know, I would suggest we don't do Section 31. Maybe we tweak it a little bit. Oh, what did you have in mind there, brilliant man? What if it's what if we do Section 31, but it's Romulan Section 31? <gasps> <laughs> Give us man rays and all of the drugs. Yeah, I. It's, uh, first of all, uh, what a great segue to talk about the Section Thirty One show featuring a don't, Michelle Yeoh, uh, Michelle Yeoh that looks like she could be doing anything else and enjoying her life. Like, ah, oh, contractor God. bitch. I, Oh, man, I bet she regret like wind the clock back to whenever she got talked into this shit. Like, oh, I'll be good. I'll be this I'll do Star Trek. It'll be great. You know, I'll get to do some conventions. I'll get paid a lot of money. It's fine. You know, I'm kind of tired of doing like, you know, genre stuff uh, for, you know, Kung Fu action and and so on. So this will be a nice break in the action. And now here she is. Just she looks like she could just just fucking die <laughs> she's so over it. her and me both uh uh poor that poor woman so her talent is wasted yeah the, the tell she are like we're gonna tell you about a big secret that should never be mentioned and it's called the zajit fash no 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 we gotta come up with a better name no wasn't that the name we, we have to no whatever their name is in the show is irrelevant peter you and i must come up with a better name Jat Vaj, I believe is what's actually called the super secret police. <sighs> I, it's so absurd. I, I, they even make section them, 31 squared, you know, they, they said uh, even, they said that the, the Tal Shiar being regarded as a secret police of Romulan uh, society is redundant because everything is so secret. And I thought secret. that was, I thought that was, that was a neat line. Yeah. That was a neat line. Uh, and they're saying this over a, montage in the background where they're zooming in on um Daj's uh Boston apartment and there is a extra secret arm of the Romulan government the Jot Faj yeah we do need a better name because I'm not gonna remember that 
Yeah, me neither. Um, Jit fash. Extra fash. <laughs> the extra fascist. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and they protect a terrible, terrible secret of something that they just loathe. And it's older than the Romulan people itself and blah, blah, blah. They end up uh, kind of spinning this conspiracy tale and Picard's like, yeah, because they're looking at footage. They can't find any trace whatsoever of Dodge or the Romulan attackers or anything from this rooftop footage they somehow got of Picard getting blowed up. And uh, then they transport directly into Dodge's apartment, which seems really creepy and scary. They don't ever say, hey, we're hacking the security system to get in there. It's just any old man who wants to transport into a college co-ed's apartment can do so in the future, which jives with the lack of locking doors and everything else we've come to know and rib Voyager about. But they get in. Everything's clean. There's no stabbed boyfriend in the corner. There's no broken tables. There's no dead Romulan thugs anywhere. And uh, the lady starts like scanning things down. And she's like, they've erased everything. And then it's the other thing that's terrible in this episode where we rehash Batman Arkham Asylum, Arkham City, Arkham Knight, Wayne Tech gadgets. And she's (laughs) able to recreate the past so we can watch cutscenes, and i'm like fucking really you're, you're taking yeah, this straight up it even lo- it even looks like the tech for- particularly from uh i want to say arkham city yeah is when they really like put that into the game let me clarify uh in arkham city it's fucking amazing it's cool Batman stuff because it works off of like security cam footage and other ambient things. And it's a great storytelling device for a video game to give people content that's optional. And they don't have to really sit around for when this is your go to in a fucking TV show. This is garbage, man. This is such a sweep of the hand magic power. Like how stupid. I couldn't say it better. It's just comes off as CSI Picard and it's just all this techno babble for the sake of moving the plot forward. Couldn't we just say that like her refrigerator had a webcam that they missed and they were able to get that or maybe someone across the street. Oh, but Peter, the super secret super police of the super Romulans wouldn't be so super if they made a mistake like that. And that's the other fucking problem. A. I'm going to put to our fans on the trauma support group what the fuck we call these guys because we clearly can't come up with a good one, but we need a name for them. And two, they just had to make these guys seem so fucking cool, right? Like, oh, they're even better at being secret police than the Tal Shiar, who are the best secret police in the galaxy, right? They couldn't. They, why couldn't they just be the Tal Shiar, right? Yeah. Like, there's no reason they had to be secret Tal Shiar that hate AIs. It, it's just. Oh, God. Anyway, spoiler. I just blew it. You know, these guys, uh, apparently their whole reason they exist is that they hate AI. The, there is a cool background note of like, have you ever noticed the Romulans don't ever have any research into artificial intelligence at all? There's a reason for that. Which, yeah, um, really good. Neat. That's neat, because that's true. If you look at it, if you look back at, at everything the Romulans ever been involved with, they've never had AI. But like I, how many times should they have been apparently trying to kill fucking data? Yeah, when they uh, had data in their it, clutches sitting there with Sela. That's exactly what kind of money. On Romulus, <laughs> on Romulus in the Pro Council's office. If, <laughs> oh well, you know what? They were just a little less extra fascist back then. That was a dark period for them. Jesus Christ. Uh. So she starts waving around this Batman detective gun, bringing up holographic ghosts of the past uh, or eyes of the past until she finds out that she's up against some extra top shelf jank and they used spirit manipulation. <laughs> they covered up the spirit, spirit manipulation. The rune <laughs> eyes of the past. Sorry, we've got other bad habits uh, and gaming in our past. But yeah, she, they use spirit manipulation to like, they use fuck up yeah, the mer- eyes of the past. So they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, use eyes of the past. And I'm just like, Oh, God, could this get any worse? So they go over the top with this stupid detective technology instead of just, hey, someone across the street saw or we got a reflection or or something. 
And then they're like, OK, well, we got to find where her twin sister is. And they get into the most boring part of this little detective mode where she starts digging around her like phone call history. And it's like, OK, so she's going real basic and just checking her outgoing calls to to get the thing. They were there. They these these tell these extra tell she the double the tell tell she are she are's. <laughs> the tell tell she are she are's. They erased oh. fucking history, literally, but they couldn't go in and just clear her phone messages. And that scene of her hacking her phone goes on so long with the worst techno babble because it's not like cool fun star trek techno babble it's like kind of real yeah. cell phone techno babble i'm like is this the fucking verizon guy explaining to me why my phone battery is running slower like just get this scene over it was miserable finally it ends and they're with some stupid ass explanation that because she and her twin look exactly alike, the computer probably misidentified them. And that's how they figure out that uh, her twin has been calling her, but calling her from off world. So she's not on earth. Okay. So that's the big revelation. Awful. That's, that's it. That's the whole thing. So Picard has resolved previously that he is going to, you know, get to the fucking bottom of this in the last episode because Dodge is dead as a consequence. He feels, you know, he can't let this all just happen in front of him and he's going to go to Starfleet and he's going to get reinstated and, and lead a mission to unravel this mystery. Part of that is he has to get medically cleared. And in, in one of the only scenes I would say have true redeeming value uh, he gets a visit from a character we've never seen before, uh, nor has ever been mentioned, as far as I'm aware, on Trek like broadcast. And that is a old colleague of Jean-Luc Picard from the Stargazer, his chief medical officer from the Stargazer, who he has asked to basically rubber stamp his medical uh, fitness for duty so that he could send it along to Starfleet to pair with his request. And then he actually shows up and is like, yeah, um, about that whole thing from all good things, buddy. That shit's happening. I thought that at first, because this guy throws him a look and, uh, you know, I'm still like, there's going to be a Starfleet conspiracy to this entire thing. And I'm like, this guy is going to be a pro conspirator. And basically, I thought that he was going to deny Picard's medical request because he's part of the conspiracy and wants to keep Picard from the truth. And that means keeping him on Earth. Um, So they talk about the lobe issue. And like you said, that gets established in the future timeline of all good things that uh, Picard's going crazy and not crazy, but like super dimension, his brain's rotting. And that's why everybody kind of like it, keeps him at the little kid's table. It's worth noting. It's worth noting that this is because he got assimilated by the way. And I don't know if that's going to come up or not in this, but that's the whole cause of his degradation of his, his brain is because his, uh, uh, was his prefrontal lobe or something like that. The, the exact turn of phrase is used in, multiple episodes of TNG as a consequence of his assimilation. That's where the needle went. So eyeball. given the, some, yeah, something like that may come up yet in the series, since obviously we're heading it deep into board stuff. Um, so who knows? That but, doctor is a real, uh, that guy too. Who is that? He's like, you. Sh- I don't. Yeah. He is a, that guy. I did not recognize him on first. He's glance. like, uh, usually, this is what happens when you don't have memory off at your fingertip. Yeah, I know, Ugh. right? We're suddenly useless. We're, we're, we're going after Darkwing's lair uh, with with Deathwing's lair with no how-to guide. Um, I, yeah, so I was expecting him to say no and be part of the conspiracy. Ultimately, he ends up approving him. Uh, talking about the scene with you now, because it's going to happen later, The it's cool that he's got someone from the stargazer like that's a nice way to touch on picard's history it should have been beverly it should have been pulaski pulaski 
the the fucking hoops they jump through to keep you away from to keep him away from getting the band back together and just turning it into a next gen show is infuriating. Oh, trust me, I'm going to get to that. You're right. It should have been Beverly. Uh, It's still cool. There's no reason it should. It was really cool. Yeah, like you said, it's really, really cool. The idea of he stayed in touch with people from the Stargazer that we've never actually seen on screen. But he served with these people for more than a decade. Right. Like that was the first part of his whole career was captain of the the Stargazer. And it makes sense that like uh, he needs a favor. He makes calls on, you know, uh, something like that to to get. I'll tell you what, I don't even need the throwaway line of like uh, things are weird with Beverly. I don't want to draw her in. If there's one person on the fucking Enterprise D crew, he should have reservations about contacting again. Sure. The woman he always had it in for and loved and never opened up to except for one episode i get why he might be a little gun shy around beverly but again that just reinforces get fucking dr Plasky in there but whatever i don't know if the actress is still alive but the the that is the most minor of yeah. the series. there's also a scene in there the force forcing not to bring the tng there was also in. a scene we skipped over where we find out that dodge's sister whose name is what dr ash yeah, same last name, Asher. I don't know what her first name is. Uh, so other data daughter. Soji. Soji. Soji Asher. That's a silly name. Dodge wasn't an award winner either, but whatever. So Soji. It sounds like a Disney supporting cast animated cat. <laughs> you just call her Jay Leno chin again. Well, I'm fine. not going to pick on that. Uh, but she's uh, she's yeah, she's fully in bed with uh romulan frankenstein who does not look at all romulan i wonder if he's going to end up being like a romulan human mix or something because he doesn't have like the severe eyebrows he doesn't have romulan complexion he's got well they note that they note that in character he's just too damn charming to be a romulan he doesn't look like the rest fair enough but like the other the other chick's like yeah "Mm, so she's in bed she's like i don't know anything about you and he's like yeah because that's the way it is uh i'm (laughs) very I'm a fucking I'm very <laughs> I'm very clearly going to be tal tal shiar shiar. Duh. Can you keep a secret? I can keep a secret. See you later. Have fun at work. Uh, then we do that medical scene and then uh, homeboy clears him. Picard for duty. And Picard takes a little trip over to Starfleet Command where we get our first real up close and personal uh, view of what the new uniform is, which, again, I support. I think it looks cool. I think it's cool as shit that they've got the all good things com badges and that those com badges, I don't know if you picked up on it or not, the edges of them like light up. I did like that the color like shoulder pads are, are mm-hmm. still in from the DS9 style uniforms. That was neat. My favorite part of the scene as he goes to Starfleet Command, though, is that in the true tradition of Star Trek, they repurposed a very normal shooting location to sub for something science fiction. Our very first episode, Peter, when we did Caretaker, no. we noted we noted what? That they decided to use a goddamn shopping mall. It's not mall. the same shopping mall, is it? Hold on. Don't. <laughs> they decided to use a shopping mall as their shooting location for the uh, Ocompen like underground city. Yeah. Right? What if I told you? It's the same fucking shopping mall. And you can tell because the doors, the doors that he comes in, if you look at them, are those, it's that standard silver bar opening for a, for a shopping mall. Like, go back to the scene. Look as he goes in the building. You'll see a bunch of people leaving. You'll see the doors. The doors are not like weird science fiction automatic. They are fucking shopping mall doors. Listen, whoever out there is in charge of Memory Alpha, I need you to get a Memory Alpha up for this episode like today. Because if if season one, episode one of Voyager takes place. No, that would have been episode. Well, it's yeah, it's a two part or it's all episode. Whatever. If that's a fucking Ocampan base. And that's where they're putting Starfleet out of. We're just a a Cardassian Romulan hallway away from greatness here. Um, So there's a little joke we get and it's Picard shows up for his appointment. He's like, I'm here to talk to the vice admiral or whatever. And security guy's like, 
okay, but I'm a young guy and you're an old guy. Who are you? It's like, didn't Picard just give some huge fucking speech televised everywhere on the Federation News Network in which he like directly disses Starfleet? So even if you're new blood and you don't know who the fabled hero Captain Picard is, you'd still think that someone working security at Starfleet would have seen all the heavy footage from the original uh, uh, Mars Space 9-11 and or the uh, Federation News Network smear campaign or whatever, where uh, Picard's like, yeah, Starfleet sucks now, which is clearly not sitting well with Starfleet Command. Yeah, it it's dumb. He, Picard seems like he's probably one of the most famous people in the galaxy from everyone's reactions. I, I don't buy anyone in Starfleet would know what he looks like, particularly, as you said, like mere a mere hours after he gives an interview that ended up being BFD, because, as you said, he talks mad shit. It was cool seeing him uh, walk through like that doorway transporter, though, to get there. Yeah. I mean, that's what the global transporter network. Nice looks to like find. Did know. they ever show that in because um, I know they do some Earth stuff in Deep Space Nine. Did they ever show that? They never show that. Oh, no, that's cool. I also noticed so far they, they show the Enterprise uh one they show the e or the d they they haven't shown the e yet i wonder if that's like a licensing issue oh there was a model of the e in his archives you sh- along with the captain's yacht you sure about that yeah yep it was there mm. i don't think it's licensing mm. uh they wouldn't have been able to include the stargazer model which was in there too so the uh the only the new stuff has to look different ish or whatever but what I don't want to get into that argument. We're already 48 minutes into this. So he gets into his um, meeting with uh, this admiral. And this is my third hated thing about this episode. He sits down, like you said, and says, hey, listen, uh, here is this theory I'm working on. Uh, here's the, uh, you know, Data's got a kid and there's Tal Tal Shiar Shiar. And I need a crew to go up into space and you can demote me if we need to. I just need to be reinstated for just one. And here's my plan. And now it's your turn to talk. And this lady stands up and I just hate the f- hell out. Can can I can I have my stroke now? Joe. I want you to have my stroke for me because I, I, I'm i going right down the same hole with you. Do it. OK. Shh, shh. OK, I got you. First and foremost, w- the, the, the biggest miss of all is why the fuck isn't this Admiral the chase? Why? Right. Why not even yeah, Shelby like or th- anybody? If this, if it, there are so many story vectors you could have gone on, depending on what admiral you chose this to be, it could have, as you noted, have been someone like Shelby who has a connection with Picard, probably has regard for him. It could have been someone like Janeway who is an admiral who we saw in Nemesis that you know could have been sympathetic or been able to like give a more like nuanced or interesting position to why the Federation is the way they are. Or it could have been Necheyev, who we know hates fucking Picard and has always hated Picard and has always been more willing to do dirt than Picard ever was. And that her, you know, worldview won out or whatever. There was all of that potentiality. They decided, no, we're not going to fucking do any of that. It's just going to be this random broad, right? Okay, so that's sin one. Sin number two is that he sits down and he starts to explain all of this and she just acts like she she just can't wait for this fucker just to get the fuck out of her office. Drops an F-bomb, which is so fucking weird to me. Awful. The right. Profanity just, has no place in Star Trek, dude. When she said fuck, like right off the bat, even Casey's like, who are they trying to impress with that? Yeah, that seemed like an edgy 13-year-old move to me that I've ever seen. Like, oh, yeah, showing how big and bad you are because you can say fuck in front of Jean-Luc Picard now. Like, no, no, it's the whole point is that the future is so enlightened that people don't fucking do that anymore. I'm not enlightened, so I fucking curse all the time. If I were a 24th century space person, I'd have different ways to fucking express it myself. But I fucking don't, Peter. But here's the big thing, is he goes into a speech about, like, she's super resentful because he, like wanted to save the Romulans and she apparently didn't think it was a good idea and didn't like that she went over all of his heads. And then he's goes like, listen, the Federation doesn't have the right to decide what species gets to live and what species gets to die. And then she goes just like out right off the cuff. Yes, we do. 
Yes, we do. We absolutely have that right. Because as her justification essentially is, is because the Federation is so important, we get to decide that. We're just so big and we have so many species in us that what we want is more important than anything else in the galaxy. And I'm like, hold, hold the fucking phone. Hold on a second. I I am willing to just go. I'm willing to die many deaths on the ground of the idea of the Federation, the United Federation of Planets having a distinct level of corruption, right? Of like any institution would have distinct levels of corruption because it's human nature that causes things to sometimes be, you know, just not quite work out because there's that is selfishness, that desire for revenge, that desire to, that you have to overcome. The whole point of even the darkest points of DS9 is that the people doing the dirt don't actually like doing it. They will, And the reason they're doing it is because they have to, to save the galaxy, to make the galaxy a better place. You know, like Cisco doesn't, you know, do what he do, does in Pale Moonlight because he wants to. It destroys him. But he knows he has to otherwise Billions, if not trillions of people will die in the Alpha Quadrant. And that's worse. When Admiral Ross makes his deals with Section 31 in that same series, he tells Julian Bashir, I don't like this, but every single day I wake up and I send young, more young men and women to die. And you know what? I like that even less. So if this is what I have to do to make this war end and make this work out, then that's what I'm going to do because that's what's most important. The idea is they're trying. They're trying to be better. And sometimes they fail. Sometimes they fall down and then they get back up and they try again. Okay. That's the utopian ideal. Even when you decide to show that it's not perfect, it is not the fucking head of Starfleet command telling Jean-Luc Picard. I get to decide when species live or die. Cause I'm the fucking king shit of the universe. What the fuck is that? And to wrap it all up in a bow, the acting out of her is terrible. I couldn't even focus on that sort of oh thing. Oh my god, yes. You've got Sir Patrick Stewart there, and across the table, it seems like the good-natured lady who works a craft services table, <laughs> that, like, her being mean is, like, so completely unbelievable. And you're talking about, like, Necheyev and or Shelby, or, or you know, yeah, like, get fucking Kate Mulgrew in there as Jamie. Someone who can stand across a table from Picard and dress him down for real and deliver yeah. any of this, these lines with any sort of weight or gravitas because she sure as fuck couldn't get it. It, it was so cringe and painful to work and her saying fuck the whole thing just fell apart. And then when she gets into it and they, they start trying to flesh out this, uh, this, this widespread objection to helping the Romulans. We, we've got ultimatums from 14 species within the Federation that we stop helping the Romulans or they're going to leave. For what? What do the Romulans ever do that's that bad? I Hold on. Not just that, Peter. They just... It not long before this attack would have happened and this all this horrible shit would have occurred, they not only assisted all the other species of the Alpha Quadrant in running off the Dominion and beating them in a war that cost everyone horribly... Uh, but they also made nice to the Federation over the whole Shinzon thing. Like th their relationship with the Federation would have been at an all time high by the time this occurred. Right. Yeah. So like, like no I, doubter. And again, this is supposed to be the super world of the Federation where Starfleet crew can work alongside the Maquis murder terrorists, like people like Lon Suter. Right. And you're wh where was the Hiroshima? Where was the Pearl Harbor? that the Romulans are involved in. I get not wanting to ever save the Dominion. I get not wanting to go and save the Borg from pending doom, you know, which Janeway fucking did, um, or Species 8 for whatever. But it, like, yeah, the Romulans were always shifty and trying to find a way to work a dagger in there and, you know, bring back the burning hull of the Enterprise. But it's not like they're over there firing, uh, what are they called, biogenic weapons, into or or poisoning water supplies like I, I just i don't get the fucking hate man it's hate for the sake of story and it doesn't work and it's silly so yeah she says and and, and to follow back on something you said and this is and I, I hate to dwell on this but this is just so important to why i fucking hated this episode is that there was potentially a convincing argument to be made in this scene by who this character was 
And not only was it poorly written, it was poorly acted. So there was no fucking terribly. But if you get the actress that played Necheyev in there, if you get, you know, someone of the acting quality of Kate Mulgrew playing like Janeway, who's now like been through some shit and seen some shit and is trying to like lay out a logical case for why the Federation needed to do what they did, that that could potentially work for a viewer. But instead, it's like you said, like they got the craft services lady, stuck her in a uniform and said, I need you to say fuck at Patrick Stewart and then read these lines on this piece of paper. And that's what it felt like. It, was, it was acting. It was Star Trek acting three rungs below what we watched in the Star Trek porn parody. And and yes. I'm not saying that to be funny. Like, that's just true. You could have taken uh, what was her name? India Summer that played uh, uh, Tasha Yar in the porn parody. Mm-hmm. And I think she would have been able to deliver the scene better than the lady they had to her shame on whoever. Fu- I, I hope that was a dear personal friend of Patrick Stewart. And that's why she was able to get that role and not be fucking recast and edited when the director saw, Holy shit, this is going to be an awful fucking scene. Complete failure, complete fucking failure. Shame on them. Um, so she sends him out. He's all stank. He goes out with his little visitor badge. And uh, we flip back over to the Romulan reclamation zone and we see that there is so it's not really like a secret site, right? This Borg cube that they are harvesting for information, parts, whatever. There's humans working on it. There's other colorful aliens and walking around. All of them are Romulan dudes with guns. It's a very unsettling view like if you've got all these visiting scientists why the patrolling guys are they there to keep the visitors in line are they there just in case the board cube wakes up and drones start pouring out who knows uh, and they start laying down exposition on what's going on exactly there that they are essentially grave robbing um harvesting technology i would assume that we're going to be led to believe that this uh this cube is somewhere in what remains of the Romulan Empire space. I believe the phrase Romulan Free State is used to describe the remainder of the Romulan government. And I also assume that it is a cube that, for whatever reason, is in Romulan space. There's a number of reasons why there might be one. We posted a map a long time ago on the trauma support group, which is our Facebook group that everybody should join who wants to hear us yelling about things um, that shows what the Alpha Quadrant layout looks like. And the Romulan Star Empire slice of the pie is very significant and huge. Uh, I get even with Romulus going down like that's the seat of the government, but there should have been enough surrounding support structure on that, that for them to be in complete shambles. I'll be curious to see how they flesh out like what's the real state of affairs did the well they're clearly not in shambles like they're pretty organized if they got this operation going i'll be curious if the klingons jumped and like maybe they're at odds now and the klingons took a big chunk out of romulan space but uh so at some point and i don't think it's unreasonable to assume that at some point a, a cube there was a secret borg attack the romulans never really talked about where they had a cube half destroyed that they didn't get but they're bringing in import help and uh it's interesting. My most fresh view of what Borg insides look like are from the last couple episodes of uh, Voyager that were focused around the space Mewtwo species 8472, the cramped 2B black dirty hallways. And that's not what we have here. We have like the Borg cube. If the Borg cube was an Apple store. <laughs> yeah, like there's. There's shots of like hallways that seem a little familiar. Um, we do get like a couple of groovy close ups of some of the basically deborged Borg, uh, you know, with their protruding uh, you know, seven of nine style extras on their face and that sort of thing. I did cringe when they opened this scene with uh, it's been basically 16 years since this cube has seen an assimilation like. Why not just play some Beastie Boys while you're at it? Yeah, very, very 20th century human joke right there, boys. But whatever. That's the least of this uh, episode since we 
eventually get a scene back at the chateau where Picard is contemplating, you know, what how he's going to proceed now that he can't use the Federation, uh, use the Starfleet to his advantage. He decides to put on a communicator and contact someone named Rafi. We don't see the nature of the com- uh, uh, conversation. Um, but we do see afterwards him telling his Romulan caretakers like, yeah, I'm going to go to space and I'm going to try and fucking settle up with this whole business with uh, whatever the fuck Maddox and the Romulans are up to. And this is when I have my second stroke. Well, before because... you have your, your second stroke, let me just throw out the, the other part of this that I thought was silly. The lady Romulan that he's living with is like, you can't do that. You're already on their radar. They want they you know, too much. Uh, they're going to try and kill you. But it's like. They they could have already killed them. They they blew up. What's her name? He was there like they already had a chance to kill him and instead they let him live like there's no continuity to that the the thing that gave me a stroke was not the blatant continuity error but the explanation for why all of the people you would expect to be involved with this matter why you are some for some fucking reason not going to be involved because the guy's like all right time to fucking get the goddamn uh, band back together call will Riker. Call, you know, call Worf, call Jordy LaForge. Let's fucking do this shit, man. All right. Like we it's time. It's time. And this like, is what you want. This is what we should do. And Picard's like, no, we cannot give them what they want. And it's for what reason? What fucking reason? What 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 is what is the reason? Give me one good goddamn reason. What Picard actually says is he basically doesn't want people like dying for him anymore um but the the problem is like hey jean-luc fuck face it's not about you buddy i know the show's about you but the problem is about commander data and the fact that he might have daughters out there because bruce maddox is making them okay that's the issue and guess what data was fucking important to everyone else on the enterprise too like Will Riker, what his first scene was with Data trying to to whistle on the holodeck and like famously like you know mourned his death at the last time we saw all of these characters on the E, you know, like right after the battle with Shinzon. There's Jordy, who was literally his best friend, right? Actually Data's best friend. The person who would want nothing more than to be of assistance and probably would be the most useful person. And probably the most single and not having a family because Jordy was creepy and not good in relationships. Yeah, unless he somehow broke up Leia Brahm's marriage or whatever and actually got in there. I'm like, whatever. Or you know what? You need backup. You need you need muscle. Why not get uh why not get Worf your like sworn sword that you like stood next to in the Klingon High Council who would like fucking die for you a million times because that's what fucking Klingons do to begin with. Like these guys would love to be involved, not just because of you, but because they would be there for data. And this is for him, not for you. And this is this is just just madness. Like, no, I'm sorry. We just don't want to pay all of them. Like, I, I don't. We know this is what you want, but it's not what we're going to give you. And, and I, get, I, I get it. I get it. It's the Picard show. It's not the next gen series two. But there's no smart reason to do it. And, and it's exactly what you yeah, said. Data was everybody's friend. Data it was data was everybody's friend. Put some put some blood on Picard's hands. Have there be some unforgivable thing. I, and you know exactly what it's going to be. It's this episode, we got Brett Spiner, and the next episode after this will be Frakes, and then we'll get Sirtis in there somewhere, and then there'll be a 7 and 9, and maybe Gates McFadden will be around, and then season 2, we're going to get Whoopi Goldberg out there. But everybody can't be there at the same time on the same screen. Like, I... <sighs> And it's one thing to say you don't get these people. 
the burn comes when they say when they're going to turn around and try and force feed you. But here's this new plucky cast that you're going to love. And we're going to have you run around who are substantially cheaper and younger and more action oriented and push whatever other marketing buttons we're trying to hit. And we're going to get a taste of the first person who I didn't really feel great about. Uh, but Neither. I mean, <sighs> It, <laughs> it was it was almost like they were slapping me in the face. Yeah. Like, yeah, I know this is what you want, but instead we're just going to like not give it to you and give you this other thing that you don't want. And it's like, then why the fuck did you bring it up in the first place? Because when like, I what? Yeah. When we just, end with all good things, it it's everybody sitting around the poker table and it's the establishment that this is now a family. We have moved beyond Picard as the distant outside command figure, and he has acknowledged that he is part of a family. He needs these people. They need him and that there's a deeper emotional connection. Nobody's getting nobody's getting paid on the Enterprise. Nobody's getting wool, space wulongs. They're there because they want to for personal fulfillment, and he has found it. And most importantly, it is his look into the future that he is now in, to, you know, in terms of temporal, you know, look look forward that his inability to unite that family and be a part of it is what causes them to drift apart and that he is the figure that can keep them together. And that is why he finally sits down at that, tells them what happened in his future so they can avoid it. And then sits down at that poker table and comes to the, you know, the conclusion that he should have done it a long time ago. And here we are at the, the payoff of that moment of now it is no longer all good things. I can go to these people who are my family and say, one of our family members that we have thought long departed may not truly be gone. And I need your help because you're the only other people in this galaxy who I know will drop everything to, to, to help with it. And instead of paying that off and making it, it, it instead, it's just, Hey, why don't you get your boys? And he's like, nah, fuck them. I'm going to go get the cheaper people <laughs> and just like, please go fuck yourself. Alex Kurtzman directly into the dirt or whoever's behind fraud. it. Whoever's you know, whoever. behind it. If I it's Patrick if, Stewart who did this, you know, screw you too. Like data who sacrificed his life so that we could all be here. I don't want anybody else to be nature. If, if we're going to go down that road of Picard saying, I don't want any more life lost in the silly adventure. All I want is, to save Data's daughter, and that's it. Nobody to be at any risk. That's how steadfast I am. This, and I'm not going to bring my family in to avenge a family death, the death of our friend's daughter, of our family's daughter. If that's the case, and you just go, hey, space god Q, who can snap your fingers and do anything. I know I've never asked you for anything, even though Earth's been endangered like a million times, and I was too proud of all that, but I'm about to die. I'm like 90-something, and I got a thing in my brain that's going to fucking kill me. Um, and Starfleet won't give me a ship, and I don't want to endanger Will Riker's life or any of that jazz, or Jordy, who doesn't have anything better going on. You think you could just, like, boom tube Data's other daughter over here so she could be safe and nobody gets hurt? But they're not. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm gonna go with the cheaper people. Give me the C team. Give me the. C they're like team. the A team. Only they're they're minivans, even crappier. Oh, I'm sorry. I'd say the A team, but we don't want to bring uh, Barkley around for this one either. <laughs> I think we found our title. Bring me the C team. <sighs> so, so nothing else in this it, episode fucking matters except. That the Tau Tau Commodore. Yeah, the Tau Tau Shiar Shiar are involved <laughs> with the Commodore who's in charge of Starfleet security. So like the the craft services admiral calls the dirty Commodore and is like, Oh, can, can you believe that Jean Luc Picard, one of the most revered and competent men ever to serve in Starfleet came here and told me a bunch of stuff that sounds like it might be nonsense. N must be nonsense. We should never look into this ever. I'm just going to tell you because I just I want to be a gossipy bitch. And then, and then the Commodore is like, don't call me with this bullshit. If it was important, I'd tell you and you take your orders from me clearly because you're a fucking moron. She's like, OK, dear. And then uh, she fucks off and then she calls in her Tao Tao Shiar Shiar agent. And it's like, yo, I'm a dirty Federation person who's working with the Tau Tau Shiar Shiar. And dirty Federation Vulcan. There's been a lot of dirty Vulcans lately. And you need to be better at being Tau Tau Shiar Shiar because Jean-Luc Picard figured your shit out. And he's asking fucking questions. 
and you need to fucking kill his ass. <laughs> and and she's like, OK. And then she's like, also kill that android. And she's like, yeah, you got it. And then, you know, she contacts her brother, who's the Tao Tao Shiar Shiar on the cube. That's the charming, sexy Vulcan or mm-hmm. Romulan or whatever. Charming, sexy Frankenstein with ears. And it's like, hey, uh, you know, how you doing sex in that android? She's like, he's like, yeah, I fucked her. But, you know, I'm still working on it because I want to fuck her more. And she's like, well, you better do whatever it is that you're supposed to do about finding where Bruce Maddox is from her. Because, you know, at, at the dirty Commodore that I've clearly already compromised might be mad at some point. I, you know, they I, I would have said, oh, you know, I suspect that there's a conspiracy here and that these uh, these are dirty players. But, yeah, they just immediately say, oh, yeah, yeah, very clearly. Tell, tell, Shiar, Shiar, look at him. There's no mystery. There's no like, maybe it's this way or that way. It's just another dirty Vulcan doing dirty Vulcan stuff, working with uh, with the enemies. Uh, yeah. We end the episode with, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're back at Gorn Rocks. Yeah, it looks like the, the classic Gorn Rocks Park. Gorn Rocks Park and uh, Picard rolls up to what looks like a trailer park and comes walking up to talk to someone and our super spunky, what I'm assuming, new captain comes out with a gun, which I think for a moment, would there be guns on Earth in the super democratic world of the Federation tomorrow? At this point, the episode had so lost me, I just didn't fucking care. <laughs> I'm like, who is this woman? Why Why does she have a gun? Why is she mad? At it's the same scene anytime anyone approaches a mobile home out in the desert. Someone comes out with a gun. The person walks away, says that one thing. Ah, oh, you bastard. You got me. out. You son all. of a bitch. What's the you job? Son of a bitch. What's the job? Bring that bottle of booze over here and let's have a good one. I just I'm fucking I was still at this point trying to recover from the idea of the commander of Star, of Starfleet saying we get to decide when species live or die because we're awesome. And I'm like please whoever wrote this if she would have said yes we get to we get to decide who lives and dies by the rules of the prime directive and sometimes we get put in situations where we would like to assist but we cannot and those reasons will vary but knowing that you have to make the choice that some people get left behind comes with the uniform and you weren't fit to wear it you chose to walk away because you didn't like the choice that was made you know, like because once for once, the the, you know, the calculus didn't work out the way that you wanted. And Your passion speech didn't work, and John Luke Picard didn't get his way, and he took his ball and went home. If that had come out of Kate Mulgrew's mouth, sure, yeah, sure, like because Kate Mulgrew could have stood there and been like, "What? You don't think you're the only captain in Starfleet that ever had to make fucking tough calls? That ever went out there and did everything in their power to make you know the the world, the Federation once the the way the galaxy." the way the Federation wants the galaxy to be. You're not, you're not the only one. We all do that. And sometimes shit goes wrong. Shit goes bad and you have to take an L and you just couldn't fucking take an L on this one. And you decided you would rather leave. And so we said, fuck off because you, you didn't get your way for once. And there was a way to lay that information out in a way that made sense. And it, they decided to do the exact opposite. To think my earliest complaints watching this episode was like, man, I'm sick of Iron Man swipey screens. Man, I'm, 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 sick. Gl- I'm glad I could <laughs> infect you with. No, no, no. I mean, these are all 14 I'm just saying, hours of boiling rage. I, these are all complaints I had. I just I'm, I'm amazed at watching this. I thought the worst it was going to get was that they were using Batman Arkham City technology in in Star Trek. Uh, I just I, now and you can see why I've had such a bad day. It's just like, a toss up between boiling, th- boiling through me. It was it's a toss up between the worst admiral I've ever seen. And we've seen some bad admirals. And uh, yeah, that that slap in the face of this is why you can't have the rest of the crew and Picard on a starship doing next gen things. Um, Man, what a huge setback. Uh, I want to ask you this. Mm-hmm. And it especially ties into all good things and all good things. Picard's already going crazy. People know he's going crazy and everybody's just like indulging him because it's the captain. Mm -hmm. But 
kind of patting him on the head and patronizing him, right? This one, he still got it together. And even my wife's like, do you feel like they're being like super kind of ageist towards Picard? And I I think they are. I, I, I think that he's not getting a fair shake in a lot of these situations for no reason other than he's like old and mothballed. It's hard to know if it's ageist. I think they've provided enough explanation alternative to that. Uh, the you know he's been on the shelf for quite a long time at this point. He's been out of the game. He walked away. No, but not just Starfleet. Like even his handlers like seem to have no faith in him. Well, the guy does, but the girl certainly doesn't. Yeah, the they they seem to kind of be taking like this. They're very protective of him personally. Not necessarily like you're incapable so much as we owe you our lives and therefore we are very invested in you not dying until the you know you you have to yeah. uh, that it felt more like protectiveness than ageism to me sure so uh yeah slow pacing um i don't think that the some of the lines that they laid out were intended to have the drastic consequences that they certainly did for anybody paying attention, which we've already railed on heavily. I think if you cut the two big complaints that we have out and look at this episode, minus why you can't have next gen and why the Federation uh, did turn their backs on them, you're you're still left with just crappy melodrama. Nothing really happens. I feel like it's a wasted episode and I feel like the overall quality is such a huge step back in terms of storytelling from the first one that like we've somehow fallen into like daytime TV. Everything about this episode was worse than the previous one. The writing was worse. The acting was worse. And the continuity was not just worse. It was actively damaging to Star Trek canon. And completely unlike everything that we've ever seen Starfleet in particular be portrayed as. They have exhaustively in every other Star Trek show prior to CBS All Access doing what it's doing uh, been shown as while sometimes imperfect, while sometimes corrupt, that the the utopian ideal of the 24th century is, is that even in those times people still want to be better and do better. And that overcoming those flaws is part of the journey. And instead we have a Federation so completely up its own asshole that we've got the very head of all of Starfleet saying, nah, man, we get to play God saying, fuck you, literally fuck you fuck you we get to play god and it's just like yeah you know what i'm glad i'm glad this show did this now because now i don't have to have hope <laughs> like i i i, I would have been really disappointed if i had to go four or five more weeks before i finally got like kicked in the balls like this <laughs> that have been the real fucking tragedy there happening now you know what cool now i can finally be where i thought it would be and that is Throwing darts at a picture of Alex Kurtzman, only only wishing it could be real. Yeah. All right, Joe. Uh, this is the part we would normally say what the next episode's going to be. Um, I'm going to cross my fingers and hope that uh, that it's up, that it's better, that we're going in a happy place. But I smell that the cheap guys, C team, plucky crew starting to assemble. I feel the ah, uh, what the hell for old times sake engage as Picard finally gets off the surface. Uh, and I feel a whole lot more of this ranting in our very near future starting next week. I couldn't agree more. And on that note, I will dread every moment until then. Thanks again to Ian and Sarah for the wonderful intro and outro music that you have heard. Uh, as noted, you can join us on Facebook at Feed Your Please and at our Facebook group, Feed Your Please Trauma Support Group, where, boy, oh boy, if you want to see Peter and I start talking some mad shit about this episode of Picard, uh, that's the place to be. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at Feed Your Please, and you can always email us at Feed Your Please at gmail.com. And we appreciate everybody that took the time to share our last episode. Really appreciate 
getting the word out, please feel free to do so yourself if you ever have the opportunity. Until next week, see ya.